Yeah, good morning. Good morning, everybody. We are recording uh, the meeting today uh, because we know that uh, we have community members in lots of different time zones and not everybody is awake at the moment or willing to be awake at the moment. Um, we're running it uh, for a second time later today for um, people in the Americas time zones. Um, so this is the first one. Um, it's what we were calling a mid-year update. Uh, so sort of like in between our annual November uh, annual meetings, we have, um, we'd wanted to um, just kind of give uh, an interim update on what we're working on. And with this one, we're focusing it on the research nexus. And you may, that may be a new term, um, but we've been talking about it for a couple of years and we wanted to really focus on it um, today. Uh, so um, a couple of housekeeping things. This is a call, not a webinar. So if you could make sure you're muted, that would be, um, that would be good. And we are recording it, as I said, um, so that we can make it available to others afterwards. If you wanted to say hello in the chat, um, that would be great. We'd love to all see who you are, where you're from. Um, and you can also use that space to ask any questions as we go. Uh, we will have some interactivity. We're going to put a few polls up throughout just to test uh, to see you know, if our assumptions are correct and if we're, um, uh, and just to get some information from you about what you're working on uh, with regards to the research nexus. Um, you can feel free to take screenshots. Our Twitter account is crossref.org and you can use the hashtag research nexus. And um, so we have a few talks today. Um, I'll be very brief uh, and then we'll have uh, a few more. We will um, also have uh, breakout groups at the end and we really are keen for everybody to stay for that because that's, we can give lots and lots of talks and we do, but we, uh, now that we're not, haven't been meeting in person so much, it's a rare opportunity really to hear from you um, and sort of get deeper, you know, uh, context about where you are and what you're thinking. So please do stay on for that. Um, uh, those won't be recorded, just to be clear. Um, okay, so here are our speakers and facilitators. Lots of people put the content together and are helping with the tech or in the background and will facilitate the breakout groups. I'm Ginny Hendricks. Um, I'll just go on the top there. I'm Director of Member and Community Outreach. Um, we have Patricia Feeney who can't join today, but I've got her on video, which I'm sure will go seamlessly. Uh, she's our head of metadata based in uh, the Boston area in the US. Martin Rittman is a product manager for many, many things at Crossref, uh, pretty much the research nexus, relationships, um, uh, event data cited by, <laughs> and uh, a few other things. Joe Wass is our head of software development. He's been at Crossref for a number of years, uh, first in our R&D team, now heading up our uh, software development team based in Oxford in the UK, and Rachel Lamy, also been at Crossref for a number of years, is uh, uh, newly appointed our director of product. So all questions can be directed to her from now on. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Oh, and apologies for my uh, crying toddler in the background. Uh, somebody will be feeding him, I hope. Um, okay, and thanks to Rosa, Paul, Isaac, and Ed, who will help with the facilitation and uh, uh, answering questions in the chat. Okay. Here's our vision statement. And I think all vision statements should start with like others because we aren't the only ones that have this uh, vision. This is supposed to be the world we imagine together uh, in the future. So um, it's not just about our role in progressing scholarly communications. It really is um, a shared vision. So like others, we envision a rich and reusable open network of relationships connect, connecting research organizations, people, things, and actions, a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. So I'm pretty sure that's not Crossref specific. I'm pretty sure many others would agree with that. And um, it really does set the context for um, uh, what we're calling the research nexus. So literally envisioning it as this diagram. So we're going to look at this quite in depth today. Um, 
we uh, traditionally would have focused very, very much on the center of the diagram. And there you will see objects and entities that have identifiers. And that used to be our main focus was talking about new content types like um, uh, data sets, software, um, uh, conference papers, preprints, grants, of course, and they were all separate projects that needed uh, thinking through in depth. Um, also in the center there, you'll see other entities that these are not all just cross-ref related objects and entities. There's also contributors there, which of course refers to ORCID and others. And there are organizations there, which refers to you know, the funder registry and the raw registry as well, the research organizations registry. So these identifiers at the center of, are very necessary, but they're not uh, sufficient on their own. And what we'd like to do is have um, a concerted effort around these other clusters of activity uh, that surround the objects and give them context. So we've clustered them into these categories, if you like, around creation of, of, of knowledge, publishing of knowledge, um, giving commentary, modifying, and uh, actually beginning with, with funding before creation. Um, so each of these labels can't be its own uh, content type, its own schema, its own uh, label. We have to break out of the mold. <laughs> and uh, I see Joe nodding. He's, <laughs> he's going to be coming into how we're going to manage that towards the end of the talks. Um, so yeah, I wanted to emphasize that this really is a shared approach. This isn't the Crossref uh, roadmap, but it's certainly something we want to get buy-in for from our partners. You know, we um, you hear us talk a lot about uh, collaborations with others, uh, and this certainly uh, will take more than just uh, Crossref's effort, but the whole community. Um, so on that previous diagram, I should have put a copy there, you can see that, um, yeah, we, we used to think about metadata, I guess, as, you know, being able to uh, say that an object or entity exists, and there would be some information about that object or entity. Um, so we were very much concerned with just those first two bullet points. It exists, and you can get some information about it. Now we want to um, gather, express, and share information about how those objects relate um, to each other or interact with each other. Uh, we want to uh, record and share what happens to these objects over time. We also want to gather information about what other people have been able to do and do with that content or um, object. Um, and we're also thinking about metadata now, not just as um, traditional, but things we may have previously assumed to be administrative. So they may be just private things in our in our uh, member database internally, um, or we maybe thought they just weren't interesting. But if we want this whole um, nexus to be completely open, reusable, uh, forkable, then we plan to expose things like payments, um, who who's paying to keep to steward this record, um, who's updating the metadata, even if they're not the publisher, um, and a how things are being maintained, added to, and even where they're hosted. So that kind of information that was normally administrative or internally, we want to start exposing, exposing that kind of information. So this, um, this vision isn't necessarily new. And as I said, it's not just cross refs, um, but it's really helping us uh, have, um, you know, put all of our work into context. Um, this is from a report from OCLC Research, and they published an initial one in 2014 called um, uh, the evolving scholarly uh, record and now this one is from 2015 where they talked about stewardship stewardship of the evolving scholarly record and this diagram is actually very similar to the one we had on the the previous slide because it's it's still got outcomes at the center so the the traditional published outputs um, but it's got a lot of process before that and then a lot of activity happening after that. So it's not just publish something and then it exists in a vacuum. There's discussion, for example, before and after. Um, and one of the things they, they also focus on in how to steward this evolving scholarly record is um, 
conscious coordination, I think that's in the title there as well, with the reference at the bottom of the, of the slide there. And that really does emphasize how, uh, how important partnerships and collaborations are to this network. It takes a village um, and, you know, our partnerships with people like ORCID and Datasite are really critical to kind of realizing this. And this is a really nice quote, I think, um, which, you know, I could just read that out and not talk because I think it captures uh, what we're trying to what we're trying to achieve. OK, so I'm going to finish there, um, but just a couple of key points. This is a reflection of where the community is heading. Um, I want to I want to move us beyond thinking just about identifiers, uh, but just beyond that, you know, what happens to um, uh, objects over time, how they interact with each other, how they relate to each other. Um, and what we think of as metadata is expanding, the notion of content types is evolving, and it, uh, it, this responsibility is all of ours. So we're hoping to encourage people to, to um, help and uh, discuss how others can participate as well. Um, so thank you for that. I'm hoping there are uh, some, some questions and I'm hoping that if there are, they're being answered in the chat, which I cannot see at the moment. Um, the next speaker is Patricia Feeney. She's our head of metadata. She is, uh, it's about three o'clock in the morning for her. So she is not uh, currently uh, with us, but she did record, uh, I'm assured it's nine minutes. So there'll be also a poll uh, at the end of her talk. So I'm going to uh, click this and hope that the recording starts now. Somebody please wave at me if they can't hear or something's going on. Hi, sorry, I can't participate in person, but I'm happy to be able to talk about the relationships in our metadata and our vision for supporting them across a spectrum of research outputs. The research nexus connects all kinds of outputs, as well as things considered parts of those outputs, like contributor and affiliation information, funding and citation. We've been collecting relationships between registered items for a while through updates like retractions and corrections supplied through Crossmark, and we also collect citations and components within our metadata. We make other metadata connections as well through ORCID IDs, where our IDs and funder IDs. These connections aren't between items registered with the DOI record, but between parts of a record registered within us. So within records um, and identifiers are essential for this. Relationships provided in your metadata allow you to make explicit connections between identified objects. If relations are flushed out, we'll be able to deliver a full picture of data set, a data set's impact or books influence or what protocols are registered to support research activities. And these record to record relationships are really essential. So as we move towards a more Nexus inspired approach, we want to blur the boundaries between types of objects a bit. Um, we've always called different support sorts of supported records content types, but that's a very rigid way of thinking and doesn't reflect the current reality of the materials used to support and communicate research. On the other hand, uh, clearly defined metadata is, of course, essential for identification and discovery. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we can support now and how, and later about we'll hear more about what, how we can potentially expand support to create a true nexus of research. So here is what we're registering now uh, by uh, content type. Uh, so we have these fairly defined silos of journal article, book chapter, book conference proceedings. This list here isn't comprehensive, but I've, I've captured a range of what's being registered. Um, so if you look at this, you'll see a, a heck of a lot of journal articles and books and chapters, maybe some conference papers, and it looks like there's not a lot going on elsewhere. But if you look at growth over the past few years, uh, and we've really seen a diversifying membership base, and we've added some new content types, the newer content types have a greater rate of growth. 
there is also a big jump in data sets. Um, we don't register a lot of actual data, but many members use that category to register things we don't explicitly support, like posters and protocols. If we look at the nexus-oriented metadata we collect, um, things that connect between objects or to, to different sorts of concepts or metadata, there are some clear winners. We have a lot of references over time. We've supported them for many years. Uh, we have a lot of licensed metadata. We have some affiliations, and we have um, a lot of ORCID IDs. The rates of this sort of metadata being provided to us are much higher with content published or posted within the past few years. Um, as members add support for new types of metadata, they tend to start with current records that they're sending to us, and then over time, update back records if they, if they feel that's valuable. Um, but you'll see that over half of the records we have have references, affiliations are rising quite a bit, um, and we hope that more members adopt the ROAR identifier with an affiliation, that's very new, um, but that, that will create a lot of persistent connections between uh, institutions and the records uh, that support the, the metadata records for the research that they generate. We also have a higher rate of ORCID IDs and funder adoptions and relationships are growing, which is good to see. So when you talk about, we talk about making connections between records in the Crossref database. Um, in Crossref records, a book is not always a book. A journal article is not always a research article or even part of a journal. It's more about whether the metadata of the item fits the metadata we collect for a given type and how it is best represented in outputs. Um, our input schema currently defines what we collect and how it is labeled and modeled. Uh, this has worked for well for many years, but it's time to evolve a bit more so we can maybe tell the difference between a research article and an article on a website that's not part of a journal. Um, the content silos really restrict us all to clearly define which are types of content and restrict us to content to a certain extent. There's a lot of things that can be registered that aren't considered content. And it makes it very hard for us at Crossrock to grow along with our membership and meet the needs. So looking to the future, uh, we really want to build a more flexible metadata model that will unsilo content, but also allow it to be clearly defined. This means consistent markup across content types. So if you are a member and you're sending us something, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you change content type. Uh, less rigid requirements and more metadata where you really need it like at the container level for journals or allowing records to be connected in flexible ways. Uh, we still, of course, need to call a book chapter a book chapter and have that be identified as such and retrievable from our API. But what you need to include in a record won't be as rigid. And just if some any of you are alarmed who are members, we're not planning to stop support for our current infrastructure and how, how things are registered. I, I know a lot of you have systems and procedures based on that, and we're, we will continue to expand our support for JATs. But we do hope as more as we add more support for things like conference events, posters, uh, research protocols, research modules, and more, we'll be able to connect them all together as we get more of these into our database and registered with a metadata record. We are starting to build some connections with relationships. These are the relationships we currently support. They are very publishing centric, but we'll be having conversations to grow this in different ways. Um, and these are the relationships our, our members currently provide most often. Um, the most provided relationships are the ones that are required, that being for reviews, we require if you register a peer review with us that that item has a DOI. Uh, preprints, we have a best practice established that a preprint should connect to a journal article when the journal article is published. We have some other important relationships that we need to collect that I think are, have obvious value um, in for relationships between grant identifiers and journal articles and any um, outputs generated from that grant money and or support. Um, translations is a big one, and of course, versions. So just to finish up, um, you'll be hearing more about our technical and product development in later talks. Um, 
but we're getting to a point where we can more easily, easily support a range of requests to make changes more effective and efficient. So we'll be able to do more engagement to make sure we solidify these connections within our research nexus and go um, really flesh out the relationships we connect. As we build new ways to collect and connect our metadata, we'll be able to be more responsive and proactive. And so in the interest of transparency, I've started communicating ongoing requests via a Trello board and get a URL here, and we can provide that via other channels as well after this uh, webinar. Um, so we do get a lot of requests for metadata features. Some are one-off requests that only impact a single member. Some are requests for metadata that metadata users need, but members may not be able to send. So it'll be good to get that conversation going a bit. And we, of course, get requests that we'd like to support, but maybe are difficult to implement for various reasons. But I think going forward, we'll be able to say yes more often. So um, I want to make sure we're able to communicate what is being requested and what we're planning to work on next. Um, so take a look at that. And I believe I have a poll next. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Patricia, for recording that in advance. And we do indeed have a poll. Uh, there we go. Poll time. There we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so if somebody could drop the link to the Trello board into the chat, um, that would be good. I, I know there is or there will be a way to add comments or um, uh, upvote things. So. Uh, okay, I am going to launch Patricia's poll, which is all about metadata relationships. Uh, and hopefully this shows. So the first one is, which of the following relationship, relationship types do you collect or use? Does everyone see the poll? I see one or two answers are oh, people are thinking very good. And the second question is, if you are a Crossref member, do you share the relationships you collect with Crossref? And still more answers coming in. Okay, I think that's been up for just over a minute. So I'm going to close it now. Yeah. Okay, so this, if I share the results, can everyone see the results? Yep. So quite unsurprisingly, references are the most collected relationship type and followed by oh, interesting finances so something finances something so that's for the funder members versions and translations they're definitely growing reviews and supplements excellent okay and uh this is interesting too if you are a member do you share those relationships with crossref only 13% say yes. Most are, are, some of these are shared with Crossref, but not all. Um, so it'd be really interesting to dig into why that might be. Uh, what are, the, what are the, the barriers to being able to share those uh, in our discussions at the end? Um, and I'm glad there's a few people, one person who's <laughs> planned to like, didn't, but now that I know I can, I will now. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing that. Thank you. We can. I, I'll see if we can try and get this data uh, into the notes documents for our breakouts uh, later. Oh, there we go. Don't want to do that quite yet. All right. I'm going to hand over to uh, Martin Rittman.
Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, really nice to be to be here speaking to you all. Um, so yeah, I'm going to expand a little bit on uh, what Patricia's been been saying, and she's been talking very much about um, the, the the kind of relationships that happen within Crossref uh, data, uh, you know, within our database. But we know there's a whole world of research which is captured um, outside of, of Crossref, and that's really exciting and interesting stuff. And so we've been thinking about how do we connect to those kind of things. So I'm going to go through a few examples and then talk about how we're looking to to share that um, those re those kind of relationships and what we're looking to do with that data. Um, so here's here's one example uh, which it might be a bit difficult to see, but on this research article from Carga, there's supplementary material, and if you click here, then it takes you to a data set which is is hosted on Figshare, in fact. And it has a DOI, the data set, but the DOI is not registered with us here at Crossref. It's registered with DataSite, which is another registration agency for DOI. So we don't have it within our database, but there is a way that we can link it. And fortunately, in this case, the publisher has provided within the metadata this, this uh, text you see in the bottom right of the slide, which um, says that there's a relationship. It's um, And this research article is supplemented by um, this DOI here. Um, and so that's a way that we can link to, um, to da data citations. And we work very closely with, with data site um, to pick up via event data, um, the uh, citations the other way as well. So when a data site cites a, a research article or something that, that Crossref has in, in our database. Um, but there are other documents which don't necessarily have a DOI. They may have another kind of identifier, and they're certainly interesting um, in, to, to the research community. So I'm thinking of things like policy documents, technical documents, patents, these kind of things, um, which again aren't within the, the information that Crossref members provide to us, um, but are certainly very interesting. So there's just one example here, which is a, a post note. So this is a, a, a piece of guidance provided to the UK um, government. Um, these are actually really interesting documents if you want to scan through them. Um, and they have reference sections which look very much like you would see in a research article. Um, and one of, the, one of the references here goes to this um, uh, document from, uh, from Wilson. Um, and I'm sure the authors of this article um, would be really interested to know that it's being used in this way. And also probably the funders of the research the author's institution and you know the publisher. There's a whole host of organisations that will be interested to know um, that uh, that the the research article has been cited in in this way. This is actually quite difficult information for us to get because these are usually within PDFs. Um, but you know we try and pick up that information where we can. Um, back in back in January, the beginning of this year, um, I was just coming back off holiday and. Uh, read this really interesting article from on the BBC um, about how people sleep and how that's changed over time, um, and and that was great. Um, if if I'd had more time on my hands, then I might have wanted to maybe dig into that research uh, a bit more. Unfortunately, the the journalist here, um, Zaria Gorvet, provided some. Uh, links to several research articles within the news article, and, and this is one of them here. Um, and uh, again, I'm sure the authors and you know the funders, institutions, and publishers, and so on would be interested to know that um, this this research article has been picked up and, and used in this way, and that's something that's um, interesting for assessing impact and. Um, the discussion around research articles, how they're being interpreted or even on occasions misinterpreted. Um, uh, and it's something that, uh, you know, we, we consider part of the research nexus. This is something which contributes to, to the scholarly dialogue. Um, and then, of course, there's social media. All sorts of discussion and commentary uh, happens on, on social media. Um, I, I don't uh, read Japanese, but this is just one example uh, talking about um, uh, images on, on YouTube and, and how they affect how things are in, interpreted. And, and this has just been highlighted in, in social media. Um, and again, there's, you know, there's conversations that happen around research on, um, on social media. Uh, we know a lot about that these days. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's not. Sometimes things blow up that you don't expect. 
that's useful information and that's something which can inform uh, you know inform the, the, the scholarly um, community but it's not of course within the crossref uh, within cro the crossref database um, and so at the moment we do through again through event data uh, we go and, and look for mentions on, on Twitter for example um, and, and try and collect those and there's other examples that you can can think of so you know people providing credit credit kudos and annotations on on works uh, grants we've talked about some of those are, are now starting to um, to be deposited via via um, the grant DOIs. Uh, there's people in institutions who have identifiers as well. Those could be considered you know, relationships to, to research works, um, especially with ORCIDs and, and raw identifiers. Uh, work gets used, reused, translated, published, reworked. Educational materials are, are also really important uh, reuse of, um, of works. And so, you know, we're thinking about how can we um, connect the works that we have in the Crossref database to these other parts of the of the research nexus. I'm going to move on to tell you about that in a in a moment. Um, but firstly, I'm going to run a run a poll. So yeah, before I tell you about how we're going to use um, these kind of things, um, maybe could someone start the poll because I don't seem to be able to do it. Uh, yeah, this is nothing cropping up on my screen. Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh, I'll let you talk through it. I'll just launch it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> fine. Let's do that. Okay, yeah. So the question is, um, you know, which of the following would be at the top of your um, wish wish list? So linking between research works in the Crossref in Crossref metadata, and so what what I mean by this question is not uh, what's the most interesting to you, but what do you not have yet that you would really like to have? Um, so it's kind of you know if it's your if it's your birthday tomorrow, which of these would you like to be uh, to 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 unwrap? Um, I just give you a, a few seconds to think about that. And just while you're thinking about that, I can talk about the. Uh, there's a question that's come about, is this part of the Crossref event tracker data? So yeah, the Crossref event tracker was a project we had, it was a pilot in about 2015, 2016, that involved, evolved into the event data database, which does collect a lot of the information that I've, I've talked about. Um, so um, <laughs> yeah, Paolo, I, I appreciate, yeah, only one choice is quite difficult for this. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of maybe having a second question to ask uh, ask again. So yeah, that's I think uh, that slowed down. So let's uh, let's stop that there and then um, share the results. So yeah, you can see here what have we got that's most interesting. So people in institutions, yeah, that's that's really interesting at the top, and then data and software, um, and then yeah, news articles, educational materials, uh, kind of some interest in those as well. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. That's uh, that's really interesting. So, what if I told you that you could get all of these relationships in a single place uh, via an API? Well, if I did tell you that, I would be lying. But that is our aspiration. That's what we're working towards. So, building one database, one API, which really encompasses all of this. Um, and, and the place we're starting to think about this is by, is by rethinking our data model a little bit and thinking about everything as a relationship. So if you think of a citation, you know, this is one, perhaps one research article referencing another research article. Yeah, this is a, a clear relationship. You've got an item, another item, and then some kind of description of, uh, of how those two are linked. Um, we can generalize that quite easily to you know, news article or tweet or Wikipedia page or what have you, and then you know mentions or sites or references or what have you, and then you know references a research article. We don't necessarily have to think of objects um, uh, as the items here. We can also think of people or institutions. So you could describe a funding of an article as a using the same kind of um, language. You know, there's a funder funds a research article. Um, and we can also think of properties in the same way. So, you know, an article 
has a publication date. And then, you know, 1st of June, 2021, this is not a research work, it's not an organization, but it's, it's a property that this kind of thing has. Um, and the other thing that, you know, we can do with this sort of language is, is say, for example, a, a news article did cite a research art article and then that gets removed for whatever reason, we can say, oh, we've rechecked this and actually it doesn't mention it anymore. Um, so it's quite a, a basic but a flexible language it, to, to talk about relationships, which applies not just to our metadata within Crossref, but is something that we can apply to actually all of the examples that um, I've talked about before. And so based on this, we're, we're looking at putting together um, a relationships API endpoint where you can query any item, you know, query a DOI, and then you get back all of the relationships that we have within our own um, database, Plus, um, so this is the kind of things, the cross ref relationships, these are the kind of things that Patricia was talking about before. And then, you know, th this is in event data at the moment, we're recording things like social media mentions, um, news item mentions, Wikipedia, data citations, these kind of things, which are a little bit more peripheral. And then also at the moment, if you want to find out which works cite um, a, 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 cross -ref, uh, a cross ref work, um, that's a little bit tricky to do, and it's only really av available to our members via cited by. We would like to that, make that data more visible as well, because you know lots of people are interested in, in citation metadata. Um, and so add all of these th things together into one kind of super database with this relation relational structure. Um, our highly intelligent developers are um, working on this at the moment, and Joe's going to uh, talk about that a, a little bit more in, in a few moments. Um, I just want to, I mean, maybe this should have been at the beginning, but, you know, this is a, a little bit of the kind of motivation. This is, this is a little bit slightly kind of blue sky thinking, don't get the, the impression that next week you'll be able to make these queries. But these are the kind of things we, we would like people to be able to ask of our data and, and get the answers for. So, you know, show me everywhere that's mentioned my articles. You know, I'm an author, I want to see everything. Um, and then we can, you know, you can filter things down a little bit. So which Wikipedia pages mentioned articles from a specific journal within the last year? Or, you know, how many preprints from a certain Crossref member have associated data sets? That might be a really interesting question with regards to, to open, open data. Um, an aspect I didn't talk about too much, um, I don't really have time to go into, is, is that alongside the relationships, we can record who asserted that relationship. So you can say, okay, show me where Crossref added a DOI to a citation. It, it wasn't added by the member, but Crossref um, added it afterwards. And we also don't have to put the, the um, research articles or the Crossref items at, at the center. We can say, you know, look at the author. We, we, do these author's papers get mentioned on Twitter and, and news websites? That's the kind of direction we're heading. Um, I'm going to pass over to Joe now to uh, talk a little bit more about the, uh, the the technical bits and pieces that we need to put in place to uh, to make that a reality. Hi everyone, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Joe, head of software development, and um, yes, trying to build what Martin just described. Um, it's all very exciting, um, all of this, just to bring us a little bit back down to earth. Um, I'm going to first talk about technical debt, um, because it's important to talk about. So tech debt is something you may have heard us talking about in the past. Um, it describes things about our software systems that make them hard to work with for, de for developers and also for our users. And technical debt is, you know, crops up over time in any system. And it's just the result of taking day-to-day -day decisions over a long period of time. Um, and the kind of things we're dealing with in, in technical debt are, you know, range from just small bugs here and there through to lack of an automatic test suite through to some larger system architecture issues. Um, and for the past couple of years, we've spent our time kind of addressing those as they come up kind of day by day, um, making life easier for our developers. Technical debt only really becomes a problem when it means that we can't do new stuff and uh, we're trying to do something different to what the system was designed to do. And it slows down progress. Um, so the research nexus 
is an expression of not only where we think the community is heading, but also we where we want to go. Um, and it does pose a challenge for our technology, and it involves kind of taking a step a bit beyond what our existing code base is good at doing. Um, and we have this question of how far can we stretch our legacy system, and at what point do we try and build something new? Um, obviously, we don't want to waste time and energy building something new for the sake of it, so it's quite a tricky question about how we make that decision. And the research nexus concept, and specifically the use cases that Martin has described, um, give us a really great context for evaluating that decision um, and actually making that choice about what we build and how kind of in an informed context. So the question is, what do we build? Well, we are currently focused on building the relationships API functionality that Martin just described. Um, and in order to do that, we do need to build some new tech. So we're taking the opportunity, uh, kind of a clean start to use Postgres, um, JSON schema, Kotlin, and the full automatic test suite. Um, and of course, we've been kind of converging on this research nexus idea for a number of years. Um, and at the heart of our new technology are some technical assets, which we built as part of the REST API and the event data. So kind of those data models and that code is at the core of our new system. So we're not starting from scratch, but we're using that technical asset that we built in a, in a new kind of way. And it's all open source, so you can see what we're building as we build it. <clears throat> That's not all we're working on. At the same time as doing this, we're continuing to work on, on bug fixes, improvements and features across our systems. And we're also, by the by, putting a lot of energy and effort into new foundations for user interfaces and authorization, which will allow kind of more self-service. That's not necessarily directly relevant to the research nexus, but we're working on kind of a, a range of things at the moment. And we've also <clears throat> been looking at our methodology, our software development methodology, um, to help us coordinate the change, because we're starting to get a lot more ambitious about our technology and our products. But really, for me, um, the most important thing, from my perspective, is that we build a software system that acknowledges Crossref's situation in the research ecosystem, and which enables us to play our part in the research nexus, and build services that play to our play to our strengths as our place in our community. Um, so we're aiming to build a system that will integrate with other registration agencies and other systems out there in the research nexus. Um, it will store Crossref um, member metadata, as well as metadata from other parts of the community in a single item graph. And by storing these all in the same place, in the same format, in that relationships kind of format that Martin mentioned, means we can then lower the barrier to integrating all that data, both with kind of within our systems and within other systems out there in the research nexus. Um, and we're also um, building new kind of evolvable internal schemas that will allow us to model that data as it changes over time. So the relationships features we're building, they're a fundamental new way of looking at our metadata and they will enable a new generation of technology. Um, and likewise, the technology stack that we're building to enable that um, will serve as a platform for new features and hopefully speed up development work and help us ultimately serve the community better. So as Martin said, it's all work in progress um, and there's nothing for you to look at yet, but please do look out for announcements and keep an eye on our blog. Thanks. I think it's me. Excellent. Richard. Thanks, Joe. Cool. All right. Um, again, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for um, for taking the time to um, to join us, whatever time of day it is with you. Um, and also, um, yeah, thanks to thanks for. Um, to my colleagues for, for setting the scene. Um, so I'm Rachel, I'm Director of Product at Crossref, um, and I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail. I'm going to kind of um, narrow in on some of the, the areas that we already support and that our members are using to, to, to try to get sort of further in achieving this idea of the, um, of the research nexus. So to go back to the the vision again, um, you know this is this is quite high level, and there's a lot of information in here, um, and I think some of which you've already identified through the the polls and through other comments um, that that feel really important in terms of building out um, a picture of 
what's happened to research and how it's how it's related. Um, obviously, there's a lot here. Um, so my kind of role in this is to um, is to narrow it down into things that Crossref already supports um, and that um, that you can already do to kind of help us and um, start to, to make these links and connections. So the three things I wanted to focus on and um, Thankfully, um, the, the poll results seem to um, seem to kind of justify um, picking out these areas um, are making sure that you that you cite um, that related work is cited in the metadata um, that you're collecting, including and including rural IDs with affiliation information and then providing funding and grant information to give that wider context to the um, to the to the work. And I'll go into these in, um, in a little bit more detail. So it was, I, I, I was really encouraged um, in terms of the poll results that Martin um, shared that um, there seemed to be good support on the call for, um, for the citation of related, related data and software. Um, I think when Ginny was introducing the section, she, she said this is about, you know, a shared approach, both between our members, our metadata users, service providers and Crossref. Um, but I know, again, my colleagues have already mentioned links to um, organisations who are trying to do similar things, such as data site with data, or good with um, contributor and author identifiers. Um, and I think of also organisations like Roar. Um, we've been talking about um, data citation for, for, for a while with, um, within Crossref and within sort of broader communities. Um, and just to re-emphasize, we think it's really important for transparency, reproducibility, reuse and, um, and credit of the, of the work. Um, as you know, a lot of the results that are shared today are summaries of what researchers did and found. So being able to access the underlying data means that we can help verify and replicate results. And that would help with the, it, that would help um, with the transparency of research. Um, being able to reuse the data means that we can um, help help the community to answer new research questions. Um, and I think also the biggest factor that is that we need to incentivize researchers to share their data. Um, so da data citation and recognizing um, or crediting researchers for sharing their work is really the first step to doing this. Um, the simplest way I can describe it is um, if you want to, to cite data in your Crossref metadata, you should just do that in the same way that you um, that you cite anything now. Um, you can add them into the um, into the reference lists, ideally using identifiers for the data. Or as um, as Patricia explained, we also support linking to related data via the relationship schema. Um, so. I think the message would be just include that, make sure it goes into the metadata that you send Crossref, and then via the, um, the event data service that, that Martin mentioned um, and a related um, Scholix endpoint. This helps amplify those links between articles and data throughout the research ecosystem. So we pass them to data site, they pass them back to us, and we make sure that um, the reviewers get recognition for, um, for sharing this information. Um, you'll have heard us talking about um, raw identifiers. Um, and I know that some of you on the call are, um, are very familiar with um, with ROAR, um, but it's basically um, an open registry of identifiers and other information about um, organizations that support research institutions, um, predominantly institutions, but also things like companies, um, Crossref are in there because we publish stuff as well. And again, you've identified that it's really important to be able to link people and the institutions to, um, to research outputs. Um, around this time last year, um, we built in support for um, ROARs, so those 
um, affiliation identifiers to be registered with all types of content that are registered with Crossref. Um, I looked um, last week and um, around sort of eight and a half thousand RAW IDs have been registered with Crossref. But to put that in context, that's an increase of 120% already since January this year. Um, we've seen ROARs registered across um, over 1,500 different, um, different organizations. Um, and to the bottom right is a snapshot that I've um, that I've taken from our API that um, that shows sort of the, the uh, who's registering ROAR IDs in their metadata in the greatest volume. Uh, in the past, this was predominantly funders who were registering ROAR IDs when they registered grants with Crossref. But you can see already that um, that some publishers like eLife, for example, and IUCR are starting to creep up the list as publishers integrate ROAR identifiers into their workflows. Um, looking kind of across um, the different kind of groups or stakeholders, um, you can see that um, there are lots of use cases, no matter who you are, um, in terms of being able to collect um, and use information related to affiliations in a standard way across different research outputs. Um, I think from things like, um, you know, making sure that you're perhaps avoiding potential conflicts of interests during the review process, um, being able to report on the, the outputs from a specific institution, um, and obviously the um, use cases for, um, for funders as well, and for publishers to be able to support things like um, publishing agreements or just seeing reliably where your authors are coming from. Um, and the other piece of work that we've been doing, so um, we started to support the registration of grants and metadata associated with grants in 2019. And the thinking behind that was and the, the push from funders is that rather than just being able to connect um, a piece of research to the funder, being able to collect that uh, in and link it to a specific grant, again, provides more clarity um, in terms of, um, you know, in, in terms of who's creating which research outputs and, um, and the aim of those research outputs, and also for the funders to be able to kind of see and report on this in an easy way. Um, so when we started to um, see grants, I think we now have around 40,000 registered with us, we wanted to take a look and see how many of those we could see cited in, um, in other items that members have registered with us. Um, not to sort of give away anything, you know, this is, this is a quick spoiler, but we're of those 40,000 grants, we were already able to see nearly 20,000. 21,000 links between research outputs and registered grants. Um, so around 10% of all of those grants, and we expect that will grow over time, can be linked to research outputs. So you can see, and um, my colleague Dominika Tkacic wrote a really good blog about this, which explains the methodology that we used in doing this. But I think, again, what I'm saying is that we already have a lot of the pieces of the puzzle to be able to achieve the research nexus, but we just need to reflect those in the in the metadata that we're that we're sharing and that we're disseminating. Um, I think it's my turn to um, to launch a poll, um, and this is just a quick one. Um, out of the things that um, that I've just talked about, um, are there any of these that your organisation is currently tackling, has tackling, has tackled, is thinking about? Um, love to get your input. Okay, I'll give a few more seconds. This is quite competitive. This um, one's so hard to prioritize, Rachel. Everything is important. I know, I know, I know. Okay, I'm going to end the poll there, and you can see that. Um, 
hopefully you agree but also as you said every you know everything is in everything is important um data citation took an early lead and then others have have crept up there so again i think we've got the opportunity to talk about these a little bit more both in the breakout sessions and in um and in wider conversations um the last thing that i wanted to talk about is related to some um to some work our um our r d um team is um is working on um and again one of the um one of the things that um is a mechanism that's used to to link research together is the is the classification of the subject area that um that the research falls under now i i flagged this as a labs project so in the same way that um that that Martin said that you know some things are are work in progress. We need to do kind of a lot of research and technical work to make sure that what we're doing is is a good fit for the communities that we work with. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to kind of come back to or tidy up is um, is the collection and use of um, subject codes or subject information in our metadata. Um, so we do have subject information in our metadata now. And um, this was from the ASJC classification cl codes um, that, um, that we grabbed from, from Scopus. And this was a bit of an experiment, goodness, back in about 2012, 2013, but the classifications crept into production lease, um, releases, even though that we knew there, was, there were some problems with, um, with these. So, we expose them in the API as a property related to the work, but actually these are related to the journal level, so you can't really infer that that goes to the work level. Um, we need to um, we need to update those more often. We know that existing um, entries might have outdated subjects, and because um, because we use Scopus to get the information, we don't apply these subject codes to everything because um, the Elsevier list doesn't cover all of the journals that Crossref has and actually contains some journals that we don't have and doesn't have other sort of container types. So this is something that we've, um, that we've been planning to address um, by training a classifier um, using this AJSC list, trained in a sample of the article titles that appear in, um, in each journal. Um, so these were kind of all of the, the issues that, that we know about already. And we're doing a little project to see if taking that um, AJSC list and seeing if we can use it to apply classifications at the journal level with enough confidence so that we could apply them to a much larger portion of the, the, the corpus that we have. And we think that this could help with downstream usage by our community. Now, Obviously, we need to make sure that we can do that with enough level of level of confidence. At the moment, as a spoiler, looking at journal titles, that's not been super successful. So we'd like to um, look down at article titles and potentially use some deep learning to be able to um, to refine our results. Um, so we also know that there are wider community conversations happening around this. Um, the Skullcom Lab. Force 11, Make Data Count, Data Site, and others are all discussing these. So it seems like one of the things that, um, that lends itself to, to an open community solution. Um, so we'll share our results once we have a bit more. Um, so, so watch this space. <laughs>